Hello and good afternoon friends, welcome to the CEC Edusat Live Lecture. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on development biology, today uh, again we will be talking on uh, gametogenesis. This is the second session on uh, gametogenesis and for this very discussion we have once again with us in our studios uh, Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjus College University of Delhi. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat and let's uh, try to get more and more knowledge on on gametogenesis. Hello ma'am, welcome to the DSET lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. So gametogenesis is the synthesis of gametes. In sexual and dimorphism species, there are two types of uh, sexes, male and female, and therefore male and female gametes are produced. We have already talked about the formation of the male gamete, that is the sperm, and today we will be precisely covering the uh, synthesis of the female gamete, that is the ovum. So the learning objectives for today's session would be to understand the differences in the male and female gametogenesis, to understand the mechanism of oogenesis in amphibians and to understand the oogenesis in insects. So what is oogenesis? Oogenesis is the differentiation of the female gamete that is the ovum. The germ cells migrating into the gonad are bipotential. They can develop into either the sperm or the egg. So we have already seen that the germ cells that migrate into the gonad, they have the potential to become a sperm as well as the ovum. And this determination depends upon the uh, environment what they find in the gonad. That is whether they are the male gonads or they are the female gonads. So the differentiation into the sperm or the egg depends upon their gonadal environment. That is the sex of the gonad determines the sex of the germ cells and in most organisms they are the same. That is if they are the male gonads that is testes, the, the gametes that will develop will be the sperm or the male gamete. And if the gonads are the female gonads that is the ovaries, the gametes that will be synthesized will be a female gamete that is the ovum. So usually the male gonad give rise to the male, uh, the synthesis is the male gamete and so is for the females. But this differentiation depends upon the environment that they in the gonad uh, which the gam uh, which they germ cells um, uh, inquire. The two decisions that presumptive germ cells have to make first is whether to enter meiosis or to remain a mitotically dividing stem cells. So we already know that the germ cells have the potential to divide and give rise to its own type. So they are the kind of presumptive stem cells. They can uh, keep on dividing mitotically and give rise to more of themselves. So one decision that the germ cells when reach gonads they have to make is whether they still have to undergo mitosis and produce more of themselves or whether they have to undergo meiosis and differentiate into the gametes which are haploid in nature. So we also understood that, that uh, the formation of gametes is very important for the continuity of life because human beings or animals are usually deployed and they give rise to for the next generation they have to produce haploid gametes that will fuse together to give rise to the deployed individual. So to maintain the continuity of life, this differentiation of the or the formation of the gametes has to takes place. So the, uh, the decision that has to be made is first whether the, uh, the germ cells still have to divide mitotically or whether they have to undergo differentiation and form the gametes. And the second decision which they have to undertake is whether they have to develop into a male gamete or a female gamete. So second is whether to become the egg or the sperm. And now these two decisions are intimately linked. As studied in C. elegans by uh, scientists, they found that both these decisions that whether the germ cells still have to continue with the mitosis or undergo differentiation and form gametes and whether it has to form a male or a female gametes are intimately linked. So as we can see that the regulation of the mitosis meiosis decision in C. elegans over testes is done by the distal tip cell of the uh, organism of the growing embryo. So if you can see that there is an intact gonad and on the intact gonad there is a distal tip cell which is present. So the cells which are near this distal tip cells undergo mitosis 
as we go far off from this distal tip there is a transition zone and finally the cells away from this distal tip undergo meiosis. So the decision between the mitosis and meiosis of the cells is based upon its distance from the distal tip cell. The proximal cells will undergo mitosis whereas the distal cells will undergo the meiosis. The distal tip cell removed or GLP-1 mutation as you can see if this distal tip cell is removed then all the cells that are present undergo meiosis. So the cells which are nearer to this distal tip cell undergo mitosis. So such kind of decision has to be undertaken that whether the cells, the cells have to continue and in some of the organisms higher organisms it is depend upon the time. In some of the organism it depends upon the environmental cues but this decision has to be made that whether the stem cells, the stem germ cells which has reached the gonads will continue dividing mitotically and when will they differentiate to form the gametes. So we have already seen the sexual uh, you know in male spermatogenesis that the meiosis was initiated continuously in a mitotically dividing stem cell population. So this stem cell population was spermatogonial cells. And this spermatogonium cells continuously divided mitotically and the meiosis was initiated continuously in this kind of spermatogonial cell. Then at the end of the meiosis we saw that the four gametes were produced then uh, it, they were spermated which then underwent differentiation to give rise to the functional sperm. But there are four gametes which are produced per meiosis. Then meiosis is completed in days or weeks so it is not very long within days and weeks the meiosis are completed and the sperms are produced and then differentiated into the functional sperms. Then meiosis and differentiation proceed continuously without any cell cycle arrest. So when the meiosis initiates it underwent all the processes all the stages of meiosis 1 as well as meiosis 2 and there is no cell cycle arrest that occurs in between. So right from the spermatogonial cell to the formation of the spermated and differentiation into the functional sperms it is a continuous process there is no cell cycle arrest that occurs in between. Then the differentiation of gamete occurs while haploid after the meiosis ends. So we have seen that the spermated is are the haploid uh, cells. So spermateids are produced which are non-functional sperms but then these haploid spermateids undergo differentiation where morphological as well as structural as well as chemical changes occur and they give rise to the functional sperm which is there. So the differentiation of gametes occur in the haploid while after the meiosis ends. Then sex chromosomes are excluded from the recombination and transcription during the first meiotic prophase. So the sex chromosomes they do not undergo any recombination and they are transcriptionally inactive. So these were the features which we have already studied in male spermatogenesis. Let us compare them with the female uh, oogenesis or the female gametogenesis which is there. The meiosis is initiated once in a finite population of cells. So we will see that in some species there is a finite number of cells which are formed which are called as oogonia and in this oogonial cell the meiosis is initiated. So in some of the cells in some of the species the oogonial cells are stem cells but in some other species there are a finite number of for example in humans there is a finite number of oogonial cells which are present that undergo or that in which the meiosis process is initiated. Then we will also see that there is one gamete which is produced per meiosis. So per meiosis there is only one ovum which will be produced and there will be three polar bodies which are there but they are not functional gametes. So in the, instead of the four functional gametes only one of them develops into a mature ovum. Then we will also see that the completion of meiosis is delayed for months or years and this happens because there are cell cycle arrests that occurs. The, during the development of, of the ovum we will see that they are arrested at the uh, different stages and therefore and require some uh, hormonal changes or some environmental cues or some you know time boundation after which the meiosis resumes. Uh, therefore the completion of meiosis takes place uh, is delayed for months or even for years. Then meiosis is arrested at first meiotic prophase and reinitiated in a smaller population of cells. So this, in his, uh, this uh, arrest, cell cycle arrest we will see will occur at one of the stage in the meiotic prophase and it is therefore reinitiated later. 
The differentiation of the gamete occurs while deployed in the first meiotic prophase itself. So, differentiation basically uh, we are referring to here is when the gamete for which is formed is a functional gamete. So, the differentiation of the into a mature ovum or a functional ovum takes place when the, uh, the, uh, the meiosis, when the arrest is there, you know, at that time only there will be a growth phase and a mature ovum will be produced and it will be released by a process termed as ovulation. So, the differentiation occurs when the gamete is still uh, deployed because it has just undergone, it has not even completed meiosis 1, which is the reductional division, but it is arrested at that particular point. All the chromosomes exhibit equivalent transcription and recombination during the meiotic prophase. So, there is no exclusion, even the sex chromosomes are included for the recombination as well as for the, they are transcriptionally active. So, these are the contrast features and we will, you know, elaborate all these features during the course of this session. So, whereas the product of the spermatogenesis, which is sperm is essentially a motile nucleus, the gamete formed by oogenesis, which is ovum, contains all the materials needed to initiate and maintain metabolism and development. So, sperm is basically the role of the sperm is just to carry the chromosomes to the egg, but the egg needs the materials for the development of the embryo also. So, it needs all the important contents and you know we will see that it accumulates it during the growth phase. It contains all the proteins, all the RNAs and all other things which are required for the uh, metabolism and development during the embryogenesis which is there until it develop, it uh, uh, you know it, uh, it starts using the external nutritive material. So, it stores all these materials in itself. However, the role of the sperm is only to bring the uh, paternal chromosomes to the uh, egg and uh, when the fertilization occur then the chromosomes basically uh, join together or a diploid cell is formed. Now, mechanism of oogenesis varies among species. In some species such as sea urchins and frogs, the females routinely produces hundreds or thousands of eggs at a time. In them, the germ cells called oogonia are self-renewing stem cells that endure for the lifetime of the organism. So, in some of the species that oogonia are self-renewing stem cells and they remain throughout the lifetime of the individual and they keep on producing the eggs throughout their life. However, in species, uh, the, so in some of the species, they produce fewer eggs such as in humans and most other mammals. The oogonia divide to form a limited number of egg precursor cells. So, we will see that the oogonia will divide and give rise to certain number of cells only. So, before we go to uh, discuss the uh, human uh, oogenesis, we will first look at the maturation of oocytes in frogs. So, in frogs, the eggs of sea urchins, fishes and amphibians, they are derived from an oogonial stem cell population that can generate a new cohort of oocytes each year. The graph basically shows that in frog, oogenesis takes 3 years. In first 2 years, the oocytes increases its size very gradually. So, you can see there is a first year, second year and third year. And during the first year, which is called as the pre-vitellogenic phase, vitellogenin means yolk, we will talk about this uh, down the lane. And in the pre-vitellogenesis phase, there is not much accumulation of the material. And in this first year, this uh, kind of growth occurs, but in the second year, and the uh, third year, it grows enormously in size during the vitellogenic phase when it accumulates most of the yolk or the nutritive material which is needed for the growth of the embryo. And you can see that there are uh, for three years, there are diff three cohorts of eggs that are produced. So, the first cohort in the second cohort and the third cohort. So, every year there is a, a batch of cells, that, uh, there are batch of eggs which are basically released. During the third year, however, the rapid accumulation of yolk in the oocyte causes the eggs to swell to a large size. The eggs mature in early batches with the first cohort maturing shortly after metamorphosis and the next group matures a year later. So, when the frog undergoes metamorphosis, the first one develops and then after each year for two subsequent years, the next cohort of eggs are produced. The first oogonial cells to enter meiosis is termed as primary oocyte. So, germ cells when they reach the uh, female gonad, they are self-renewing stem cells and they are called as oogonia. So, they keep on dividing mitotically to produce more of themselves and after a while, you know, like when we said for example after metamorphosis, 
the first the the oogonian cells will undergo will start uh, will start entering the process of meiosis and such oogonian cells are termed as the primary oocytes the primary oocytes progress through the first meiotic prophase until the diplotein stage at which it can remain for years so there is a cell cycle arrest that will occur the uh, the uh, the, divi the dividing primary oocytes will be arrested at the diplotein stage of the first meiotic prophase the resumption of the meiosis in the amphibian oocyte requires progesterone so the hormone progesterone is the stimulus that will uh, that will uh, lift this block and the meiosis will resume within 6 hours of progesterone secretion the primary oocyte divides its nucleus which is called as the germinal vesicle it breaks down and the phenomena is called as germinal vesicle breakdown or GVBD. The microvilli retract the nucleoli breakdown and the chromosomes contract and migrate to the animal pole to begin the division. So whenever there is a progesterone stimulation then within 6 hours the germinal vesicle breakdown occurs. At telophase or the end of the division, one of the two daughter cells contain hardly any cytoplasm whereas the other cell retains nearly the entire volume of cellular constituents. So there is an unequal cytokinesis that occurs and the significance of this unequal cytokinesis is very important because all the cellular component is given to only one, uh, one cell and the rest of the cell contains negligible cytoplasm as we have already seen that the end product of the meiosis in oogenesis is only one mature ovum. So rest of the three cells you know why to give cytoplasm to those three cells which are not going to form the egg. So entire content is retained with the mature ovum and the polar bodies which are called as these polar bodies contain very less amount of cytoplasm. The smaller cell is called the first polar body and the larger cell is referred to as the secondary oocyte. The secondary oocytes begin second meiotic division however it gets arrested at the metaphase and the egg in this stage is ovulated. The release of the mature ovum from the ovary is termed as ovulation. So we can see that the regulation by the progesterone and fertilization of meiotic cell division in frog. The germinal vesicle is there and the interface arrest or the G2 prophase arrest is there. The first arrest is that it, it is occurring at the diplotene stage of the first meiotic prophase and the molecular reason is because there is no active mitosis promoting factor which is there. So there is an inactive MPF which is there that causes the arrest at the diplotene stage of the first meiotic prophase. And as we can see the stimulus of the progesterone it basically adenylates the CMOS RNA which is present in the egg and it causes the phosphorylation of the P34 subunit of the inactive MPF causing it to turn into an active MPF and this active MPF lifts up the block of the diplotein stage and the, uh, the cell enters the first meiotic metaphase stage. So there is a division that occurs, the germinal vesicle goes to the periphery, the spindle formation occurs at that time and there is an unequal cytokinesis that is occurring and as you can see it has given rise to one secondary oocyte and the small polar body. The secondary oocyte undergoes the, uh, both the cells underwent this, uh, the second mitotic, pro, meta, uh, second meiotic division but at second meiotic division then there is a metaphase block that is occurring. And this metaphase block is occurring because there is a factor called as cytostatic factor that does not let the division to proceed beyond the metaphase stage. If the fertilization occurs at this stage then the fertilization causes the calcium flux. This calcium flux causes the uh, acts on the calmodulin protein and acts on its two subunit the CAM PK2 and the calpene and with these two subunits causes the degradation of the cytostatic factor. The degradation of, of the cytostatic factor lifts up this metaphase block and due to this fertilization the cell uh, the, uh, the dividing uh, secondary oocyte as well as the polar body they underwent the completion of the meiosis too and therefore this occurs. Therefore the fertilization is basically happening at the diploid stage only. And after because of the fertilization the final meiotic 2 division is completed and one mature egg ovum is formed and three polar bodies are formed. So you can see that there is only one mature ovum which is there. 
So, this is how the progesterone, the hormone progesterone as well as the fertilization causes the meiotic cell division in frog and it is intimately linked with the process of the oogenesis. So, ovum is released at the second meiotic metaphase stage when there is a block at the uh, at the metaphase stage. So, this the, uh, the, uh, the ovulation is done at that time, but fertilization, fertilization causes it to complete the meiosis too and produce the mature ovum which is there. So, because the growth phase is very elaborative as we said that you know the, the egg has to accumulate all the material which it needs for the further thing therefore, the growth phase is very imp important and there are two stages the pre-vitellogenesis and the vitellogenesis. In pre-vitellogenesis there is no egg synthesis but the synthesis of nuclear material and cytoplasmic contents and in vitellogenesis the yolk synthesis occur. So, in pre-vitellogenesis the nucleus enlarges due to the increase of the nucleic acids there is a production of large amount of nuclear sap and this kind of, large, kind of large size nucleus bloated with sap arrested at meiotic prophase 1 is termed as the germinal vesicle. The chromosomes become attenuated, they lose their staining property. The DNA precursors and RNA such as tRNA and 5S RNA they accumulate. There is occurrence of specialized chromosomes which are called as Lambrush chromosomes. This Lambrush chromosomes is because it requires the rapid production of RNA, there is gene amplification that occurs. So, there are loops of RNA which are basically uh, you know distangled and therefore, it give rise to the appearance of the lamp brush and this open loop tends to uh, you know cause the synthesis of the genes many fold. And therefore, formation there is also formation of one or more nuclei. This Lambrush chromos chromosomes is a characteristic of the amphibian oocytes. Then in the cytoplasm, the quality as well as the quantity increases, the mitochondria increase in number and the mitochondrial clouds are called as the balbiani bodies. The ribosomes become nu numerous, the vesicles of SER are dispersed, RER however is not found. Why it is not found? Because the function of rough endoplasmic reticulum is basically protein secretion and the egg does not, egg cell does not want the proteins to be secreted, it just wants everything to be accumulated and therefore, rough endoplasmic reticulums are not needed and therefore, not found. Then annulated lamellae are found, the Golgi complex takes active part in the formation of what is called as cortical granules. Now, cortical granules are membrane bound organelles located in the cortex of unfertilized oocytes. They are homologous to the acrosomal vesicles of the sperm. So, they also contain enzymes. They contain proteolytic enzymes, mucopolysaccharides that are active in preventing polyspermy adhesive glycoproteins and hyaline proteins that provide support for the cleavage stage blastomeres. So, we will see the role of cortical granules when we will do the fertilization, but these cortical granules are formed and they are uh, lying in the periphery of the uh, inside the periphery inner periphery of the egg uh, membrane which is there. The cellular components as you can see stored in the mature oocyte, there are mitochondria. So, there is approximate excess over the amount in the larval cell. So, so many number of mitochondria increases, the RNA polymerases increases, DNA polymerases increases, ribosomes number increase, tRNA, histones, deoxyribonucleoside, triphosphate. So, all the cellular component number increases in size to accumulate the, com the constituent, the, the, the material in the cytoplasm before this thing. Vitellogenesis is the synthesis of the yolk. Yolk is the main nutritive material accumulated in substantial quantities in the egg cytoplasm to meet the basic requirements of embryonic development in oviparous uh, animals. They are comprised of three chemical components with proteins, lipids and carbohydrates. There is a protein yolk which has proportionately more protein, egg of many invertebrates, lower chordates and mature amphibian oocytes are proteinaceous. There is one which is lipid yolk that has proportionately more fat, the eggs of bony fishes, reptiles and birds. The proteins are of two types, the lipoprotein or the phosphoprotein also called as the vitellins and the lipid are the fatty yolk globules or phospholipids and triglycerides and carbohydrates are primarily glycogen, galactogens and glycoprotein. So, yolk is basically a complex mixture of protein, lipids and carbohydrates. Yolk protein can also be in the form of droplets or it can also occur in the form of platelets in the ooplasm. The precursor yolk protein is called as vitellogenin. After synthesis in the extra ovarial organ, it undergoes post translational changes such as phosphorylation, glycosylation and sulfation in addition to the 
lipid binding and this is termed as heterosynthesis. Autosynthesis is the process where oocytes synthesize yolk in annelids, crayfish, echinoderms, bivalve and mollusk where the oocyte itself synthesizes the yolk. So what happens in the heterosynthesis that the precursor of the yolk protein vitellogenin is secreted somewhere else for example in the liver and then by micropenocytosis it is taken up by the follicle cells and through the microvilli or the cell drinking it basically goes into it is uptaken by the uh, by the German germ cells growing germ cells and there it uh, it accumulates to so the lipovetilin and phosphovitin arrange themselves to give rise in kind of arrays to give rise to yolk platelets. So this is a crystalline structure in the main body of an amphibian yolk platelet where there is such kind of array arrangement is which is occurring in the case of amphibians. So the yolk platelets get accumulated and into the amphibian oocyte. So we can see some of the pictures which are there which is clearly depicting the oocyte in the primary growth stage where there is a number of nuclei in the periphery the, the picture number A. Then oocyte in the secondary growth stage where the germinal vesicle has broken down and the lipovite uh, has been occurring and there is a lipovitalin uh, there is a yolk platelet formation which is occurring at the periphery. Then the C shows oocytes during various stages of oogenesis stages 2 and 3 are the primary growth stage and stage 4 and 5 are the secondary growth stage where the yolk deposition occurs. D is showing the details of the C and you can see that there is you know there are arrows. The arrowhead just depicts the lambrush chromosomes and their nuclei which is shown and on the periphery you can see there are follicular cells which are there and in the in the cell number 5 there is large accumulation of the yolk platelets which are yolk platelets which is occurring at the periphery. Then in the E uh, there is oocyte in stage F5 with abundance of yolk platelets. So that is a zoomed out portion of the oocyte in stage 5 with the abundance of yolk platelets which is there. In stage number 4 the yolk platelets are forming in the periphery and they are all acidophilic yolk platelets which are formed. Similarly in this the oocyte in the, the number 6 which is a full grown stage can be seen. The germinal vesicle does not have a clear boundary and there is a uh, peripheral yolk platelets which are found. So this is the fully grown stage oocyte which is then ovulated. So you can see there are thecal cells, there is a lumen which is shown, there is a thecal artery which is there, there are follicular cells and the pigments are deposited there. Just the arrowheads point out to the lambrush chromosomes which are very much visible and then there are nucleoli also which are visible. So these are some of the real pictures of the amphibian eggs which can be uh, seen in different stages of the oogenesis which is there. So oogenesis is the synthesis of ovum and we have seen the oogenesis in case of amphibian where the oogonial cells or the stem cells you know self renewing stem cells they undergo meiosis. Uh, the, the cells oogonial cells to give rise to primary oocytes. The primary oocytes is arrested at the first meiotic prophase and it needs the stimulus of progesterone which is there at the time of metamorphosis. So after that they basically this lift the, the, this block is lifted up and it enters the uh, next uh, it, it completes the first meiotic pro, uh, first meiosis it completes the meiosis one and give rise to the secondary oocyte as well as the first polar body. The secondary oocyte enters the meiosis two but gets arrested at the metaphase stage again and the lift is now taken up by the fertilization where it further completes the meiotic prophase uh, meiosis two and give rise to the mature ovum at during the fertilization or give rise to the haploid nuclei basically. In this particular session we will talk about the oogenesis in case of insect, we will talk about the oogenesis in humans, we will talk about the understand of and we will talk about the ovulation in mammals, we will study about the egg membranes and we will also study about the different types of eggs. So to start with and we understand the different kind of oogenesis that is occurring in case of insects which is called as the meroistic oogenesis. The drosophila and moths undergo meroistic oogenesis in which cytoplasmic connections remain between the cells produced by the oogonium. So this is the drosophila ovary and where the beginning of asymmetry occurs. So you can see there is a germanium 
and there are nerve cells and there is only one egg that develops. So this is a meristic oogenesis because as you can see that the one egg will give rise to there is a, a one oogonial cell will give rise to 16 cells which are all connected together and out of these 16 cells only one will grow into the mature ovum and rest 15 will be called as the nurse cells. So all the proteins and the RNA and everything which is required by the mature ovum is produced by these nerve cells and they are transported to the mature ovum for utility. So rest of the cells and this kind of organization is called as the meristic oogenesis. So it is a peculiar type and therefore needs a mention here. Nerve cells are very metabolically active, they make RNA that is transported to the oocyte cytoplasm. Transcriptional efficiency of nerve cell is aided by becoming polyteen. So we saw that in amphibian oocytes, the transcription is, is enhanced by, uh, by Lambrush chromosomes. You know there are loops of DNA which are open, there are loops of DNA which are present and which are very transcriptionally active and they are rich in this rRNA gene. So there are multiple number of rRNA genes which are present in these loops which causes the transcription to take place rapidly. In the case of dipterans, which is basically drosophila, for example, salivary glands, this kind of arrangement is there. So the nurse cells, what they have done is they have, uh, they do not contain only two copies of one gene, but they are uh, two copies or they do not contain only two chromosome or two chromatids, but the chromatids keep on dividing without division of the cytoplasm. So one chromat, there are, you know, uh, sometimes uh, 10 times they will divide and there will be 1000 chromatids which are lying. So they increase the number of gene by such an arrangement and such an arrangement of chromosomes is termed as the polyteen chromosomes. So the transcriptional efficiency is enhanced in many fold and the RNA which is produced they is then provided to the mature ovum in this case. Looking at the maturation of the mammalian oocyte, in the human embryo, the thousand or so oogonia divide rapidly from the second to the seventh month of the gestation to form roughly 7 million germ cells. So basically during the gestation period only, the oogonia cells are produced and these oogonia cells divide mitotically, they proliferate rapidly and they give rise to certain 7 million germ cells. After 7 months, the number of germ cells drop precipitously and most oogonia die during this period while the remaining enter the first meiotic division. So as we already mentioned that in human beings there are finite number of oogonial cells which are there. So at the time of birth there is a finite number of oogonial cells which are present which is, has increased to a large extent during the first 7 months of the gestation. So you know oogonial cells are produced and proliferated even before the embryo is born or even before the baby is born. It starts from the uh, initial 2-3 two, two months only and up to 7 months they increase in number and then they start uh, decreasing and at the time of birth the female contains around 2 into 10 raised to the power of 6 germ cells which are there or oogonial germ cells which are there. These most oogonia again die during the period and only a few of them, you know, over the period of uh, time, for example, over the period of 50 years, only a few oogonial cells will undergo meiosis and give rise to the mature ovum. While the, and these ones to start with are the primary oocytes which are there. So within the adult human ovary, these primary oocytes are maintained in the diplotene as in amphibian uh, oogenesis, they are maintained in the diplotene stage of the first meiotic prophase and this stage is often referred to as the dictyard stage. Each oocyte is enveloped by a primordial follicle consisting of a single layer of epithelial granulosa cell and a less organized layer of mesenchymal thecal cells. So there are two types of cells which are surrounding the uh, primordial follicle which contains the primary oocyte that is rested in the dictyard stage. So you can see the primordial follicle which are formed by the thecal and the granulosa cells and then there are uh, basically the oocyte which is present inside rested at the diplotene stage. Periodically a group of primordial follicles enter a stage of follicular growth and during this time the oocyte undergoes a 500 fold increase in volume. So it starts accumulating the material, it starts accumulating the cytoplasmic contents and therefore there is an enormous increase in the size of the primordial follicle and it grows up to the size of 500 fold increase. 
Concomitant with oocyte growth is an increase in the number of granulosa cells which forms concentric layers around the oocyte. So there is a developing oocyte which is growing inside in between and then there is a primordial follicle which has increased in size and apart from them even the thecal cells and the granular cells basically have also increased and they lie in a concentric circles around the oocyte. So you can see this is a mature graphene follicle which is formed. The fully grown follicle contains a large oocyte surrounded by several layers of granulosa cell. The innermost of these cells will stay with the ovulated egg forming the cumulus which surrounds the egg in the oviduct. So you can see that there is a purple colored uh, ovum. Uh, purple colored oocyte which is lying inside and then there is a uh, there is a layer of granulosa cell which is surrounding this oocyte just next to it these cells are called as the cumulus then additionally during the growth of the follicle an antrum cavity forms and become filled with a complex mixture of proteins hormones and other molecules so this antrum has also developed in this particular uh, grown follicle which is called as the graphene follicle the oocytes are maintained in the dictyard stage by the ovarian follicle cells. The release from the dictyard stage and the reinitiation of meiosis is driven by luteinizing hormone from the pituitary. So, at the onset of pu puberty, which is you know around uh, 13, 14, or the age basically varies, but at the onset of puberty, this luteinizing hormone is secreted and this causes a release from this diplutine stage or the dictyard stage and the meiosis is resumed in the primary oocyte. Ovulation in mammals, so before we talk about in detail that how it happens, let us see look at the ovulation in mammals also. Ovulation in mammals follows one of the two patterns and it depends upon species. Ovulation in some of the mammals is stimulated by the act of copulation. The physical stimulation of the cervix triggers the release of gonadotropins from the pituitary these gonadotropins signals the egg to resume the meiosis and initiate the events that will expel it from the ovary. For example, in rabbits and minks. So, you know that makes sure that you know uh, the fertilization is 100% possible. Therefore, the rabbits and minks they are sent to be procreative in nature because every act of copulation would lead to the fertilization of the egg because the basically the ovulation is, uh, is uh, linked to the a process of copulation which is there. However, in other mammals, in most of the mammals, the periodic ovulation occurs. The females ovulate at specific times during the year. This particular time period is called as the estrus. Environmental cues stimulate the hypothalamus to release the gonadotropin releasing hormones or the GRH. The GRH stimulates the pituitary to release the gonadotropins, the FSH or the follicle stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone that causes the ovarian follicle cells to proliferate and secrete the estrogen. So, estrogen is basically evoking that mating behavior which is the characteristic of these particular species such as dogs etc. So, gonadotropins also stimulate follicular growth and initiate ovulation. So, gonadotropins in this case are released because of certain environmental cues and therefore, there is a periodic ovulation. So, there is a specific time period in a particular year when the ovulation will occurs. In mammals, there is a variation on this periodic ovulation thing. It shows a variation on the theme. It has cyclic ovulation averaging about once every 29.5 days and there is no definitive yearly estrus. Characteristic primate periodicity in maturing and releasing ova is called as the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle represents integration of basically three very different cycles. One, the ovarian cycle, which is function of which is to mature and release an oocyte, which primarily we are talking about in this session. Then there is a uterine cycle, the function of which is to provide the appropriate environment for the developing blastocyst. And the cervical cycle, the function of which is to allow the sperm to enter the female reproductive tract only at the appropriate time. So basically it is the integration of these three cycles and as in this diagram we can see that the body temperature how it increases and decreases then hormonal changes which we have talked about. So there is a recruited follicle which is there a follicle you know which has grown outside the primary uh, oocyte which is developing then it is growing in size then it become enormous in size it is a mature follicle now. 
then in mature follicle the ovulation occurs so there is a time period also given the days of the menstrual cycle however the average values or the durations and values may differ between different females or different cycles so as you can see when the ovulation there is a menstrual menstrual cycle that is occurring and when it is starting from the day 1 then around 13 to 15 days from the start of the menstrual cycle the ovulation will occur at the time of ovulation the luteinizing hormone as well as the follicle stimulating hormone has increased so there is this this is a periodic ovulation that has occurred then after 13 to 15 days that the endometrial uh, histology is also shown so endometrial material has increased in size and by the 28 days when the progesterone is there the progesterone has dropped down their ovulation has occurred, the release of the ovulation, the leftover graphene follicle is termed as corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will start producing progesterone and this corpus luteum will further degenerate and the progesterone level will go down. When the progesterone level has gone down, so there is low progesterone, there is low follicle stimulating hormone and there is low uh, estrogen which is there or low luteinizing hormone which is there. So when every hormone is basically lower in uh, concentration then the menstrual cycle will commence and during the menstrual cycle commensation gradually the again the oocyte is taken up by the uh, follicle and the maturation of the follicle will start. So it is a kind of a periodic cycle that is occurring and it takes around at an average 28 to 29.5 days that is occurring. So that is how you know the uh, egg, the oogenesis takes place in mammal. Then primary oocyte, there is only one uh, arrest that is happening at the diplotene stage and this diplotene stage arrest or the dictyad stage arrest is lifted by the production of the luteinizing hormone that occurs at the onset of puberty. After the onset of puberty, once the menstrual cycle starts, then periodically the ovulation occurs and this ovulation is basically the mature ovum that is released. It will undergo the first meiotic prophase, then it will undergo the second, uh, second meiosis and will produce, give rise to the one mature ovum and three polar bodies. And that one mature ovum uh, will remain in, in the ovary, will be then, you know, really, uh, will, when released, when the ovulation has taken place, it will be released. If it, the fertilization occur, it will lead to the formation of the zygote and uh, you know implantation to grow into the embryo. However, if the fertilization has not occurred, then this mature ovum will again be thrown out of the body in the term of the menstrual cycle. So this will periodically go on if the mature ovum that is released at the 14, 13, 14, 15 days after the onset of the previous menstrual cycle, if, it, if the fertilization does not happen then gradually the, uh, the ovum will be thrown out of the body. However, if the successful fertilization uh, happens, then the, uh, it will be implanted and the embryo will be formed. So that is how the oogenesis takes place and it will lead to the uh, fertilization if the, if the sperm entry occurs at the appropriate time. So if the uterine cycle and cervical cycle are also correlating with the ovulation cycle, then the fertilization, successful fertilization will occur. Now when the ovum is released, it is not just the ovum that is released into the uterus. However, the ovum, uh, it is taken up by the, uh, uh, by the, um, uh, uh, it uh, finally enters into the uterus which is there but uh, the uh, it is surrounded by a lot of egg membranes which are there. So we will talk about the different kind of egg membranes which are surrounding the any of the membranes forming the investing envelope of the ovum is termed as the egg membrane. There are primary egg membranes which are produced from ovarian cytoplasm, vitellin membrane and zona radiata are examples. There are initial stage mucopolysaccharides, however later they are formed by the uh, additional of the fibrous protein is there. The secondary egg membranes, the product of the ovarian follicle, it is basically the product. So depending upon whether the oocyte or the ovarian follicle or both are, uh, are uh, aiding in the formation of these membranes, there are primary, secondary and tertiary egg membranes. So primary egg membrane is primarily produced from the ovarian cytoplasm. Secondary egg membrane is the product of the ovarian follicle which is surrounding follicle which is surrounding the mature ovum. And zona pellucida is one example. 
tertiary egg membranes is secreted by the lining of the uterine tube. So, when the ovum passes through the uterine tube, then this, uh, uh, this tertiary egg membranes are secreted for example, the shell. Vitelline membrane is found in insects, mollusks, amphibians and birds and you can see that you know there is a on the left hand side you can see there is a vitelline membrane which has been cracked. So, you can see the inner egg and the outside thin vitelline membrane which is present uh, and vitelline envelope which is also thrown into the microvilli in the case of sea urchin egg. So, there is a cortical granule which is shown with the concentric rings of the proteins and then there are microvilli which are present and even the vitelline membrane is thrown into this kind of extensions or microvilli which is there. Then zona radiata is present in worms, mollusks and echinoderms, vertebrates and fishes such as sharks and bony fishes, amphibians and reptiles. It is called a zona radiata because it has radiations, you know it, it is a, it has striated appearance. For example, you can see the follicle epithelium and zona radiata of full grown oocyte in fish. So, there is an outer layer of cytoplasm, ooplasm and in between there are striations which is called as the zona radiata. So, zona radiata is however, the type of a, a primary egg membrane. So, it is also produced from the ovarian cytoplasm. Outside the zona radiata, there may be a thick jelly layer for example, in sea urchins usually there is a very thick jelly layer which is found. Primary egg membranes may be also pierced by micropiles for example, in echinoderms, fishes and gastropods. Micropiles are basically the dedicated openings from where the sperm enters and meet the mature ovum. So, sometimes these primary egg membranes are pierced by these structures called as micropiles. Now, talking about the secondary egg membrane zona pellucida, it is formed by the follicular epithelium. It is formed in the interstice between the plasma membrane of the oocyte and the follicle cells. It can be pierced by microvilli on egg surface and similar, but longer prolong prolongations on the follicle cells. And there is no direct continuity in between these the egg surface as well as the follicle cells. So, there is no continuity, but they can be thrown into the microvilli which is there. In humans, the zona pellucida is non striated in appearance and it is formed by the follicle cells as well as oocyte. So, it is not exclusively by the follicle cells, but both the oocyte as well as the follicle takes part in the production of the zona pellucida in humans. Mammalian egg is also surrounded as we have al already talked about by a layer of cells which is called as the cumulus and this cumulus flows, cumulus is basically the layer of the follicle cells which also flows along which is made up of the ovarian follicular cells. The innermost layer of cumulus cells immediately adjacent to the zona pellucida is called the corona radiata. So, zona radiata is a primary egg membrane, however, corona radiata is the layer of the follicle cells which is immediately adjacent to the growing oocyte which is there. So, this and their zona pellucida is again a secondary egg membrane produced by the follicle as well as the uh, oocyte in case of human beings and zona pellucida outside that lies the follicular cell layer or the cumulus layer and immediately next to the zona pellucida there is a layer of corona radiata in the humans. Then there is a specialized uh, tertiary egg membrane or the secondary egg membrane which are called as chorion. It is in insects and cephalopods. It is formed by follicle cells as well as the cuticular secretion. Uh, its substance resembles the keratin then chitin of the adult. So, the keratin the chit the, in the adult insects usually there is a chitin deposition, but in the chorion it is basically resembling the keratin protein which is basically there in the case of uh, chorion. So, you can see in this picture different types of eggs, there is an insect egg in longitudinal selection, there are different types of insect eggs in 2a and 2b, there is a bell moth egg, there is a pine beauty egg, then there is a cabbage butterfly, white butterfly egg, there is a dung fly egg, there is a mosquito egg which is shown, there is a head louse egg which is there. Then uh, figure number 3 is the longitudinal section through the upper pole and micropile of a butterfly egg. So, there is an opening or a micropile which is shown here from where the sperm will enter. Uh, the figure number 4 is compound egg of a tape form in which many small eggs are you know enclosed in a particular shell. Then a uh, fifth one is the salamander egg with membranes which are displayed. Then sixth is a longitudinal section through a hen's egg again showing the outer shell and different kinds of egg membranes which are there. 
and then we have already talked about the mature human egg cell with the corona radiata, the follicle cell layer which is lying immediately outside the zona pellucida which is there and inside there is a nucleolus or which will form the germinal vesicle. So, these are the different types of eggs which are there. Uh, these were the different uh, types based upon the morphology of the egg, but the eggs can also be differentiated on the base of on, on other bases also. One of the bases is the differences uh, based on the difference in the amount of yolk which is there. So, yolk is the you know nutritive material which is required by the growing embryo and uh, the uh, you know after fertilization. So, this depending upon the amount of yolk there can be different types of eggs. There can be alacetal egg that egg contains no yolk for example, the eggs of the eutherian mammals. Then microlacetal or oligolacetal egg, where the egg contains small or negligible amount of yolk. For example, in lower chordates such as amphioxus and tunigate, so very low amount of yolk is present. And then there are macrolacetal or megalacetal eggs, the egg containing large amount of yolk, for example, the eggs of bony fishes, reptiles, amphibians and birds. Usually these are the eggs you know where, where they are laid outside and they require the, the, the growing embryo depends upon the egg for a large amount egg uh, stored material for a large amount of time. So, it needs nutritive there. However, alacetal egg for example, in mammals, you know it contains very, very negligible amount of yolk because soon after the uh, fertilization when the embryogenesis is occurring, then the placental formation is there. So, it starts deriving the nutrition from the mother. There is an internal fertilization and internal growth which occurs. So, it does not depends only upon the yolk. So, it does not require a large amount of yolk which is there. Then based on the distribution of the yolk, there is isolacetal or homolacetal egg, the egg is you know the yolk is distributed uh, evenly or uniformly in the ooplasm for example, in the eggs of echinoderms, amphioxus and mammals. In telolacetal eggs, the distribution of yolk is not uniform, it is usually concentrated more towards one pole of the egg and that pole is termed as the vegetal pole, the other pole is called as the animal pole. The egg, for example, the eggs of fishes, it is termed as slightly telolacetal, vegetal pole has the highest concentration of yolk and animal pole has lesser. Amphibian eggs are moderately telolacetal and reptile and avian eggs are highly telolacetal because they are megalacetal eggs. Then there is a centrolacetal egg in which the nucleus lies at the geometric center of the yolk mass surrounded by a small amount of cytoplasm. A thin cytoplasmic layer covers the surface of the yolk. Fine strands of cytoplasm extend from the peripheral zone layer to the zone occupied by the nucleus. For example, the eggs of many arthropods and the some sealant traits which are here. Now, based on the presence or absence of shell, there are cladoic eggs and non-cladoic eggs. Cladoic eggs, when they are laid on the dry land, contain a waterproof shell around itself. Non-cladoic eggs, for example, eggs of amphibians, which are laid in water and they are not protected by the shell. And the last is the based on the type of development, the determinate or mosaic eggs. In the development of certain animals, the fate of each and every part of the egg is fixed before or at the time of fertilization. If a particular portion of the egg is removed, the developing embryo will be deficient in the particular organ. For example, the eggs of annelids and arthropods and there is an indeterminate or regulative egg. In this type, there is no predetermination and the fate of various parts of egg is usually not fixed until the cleavage division. So, at this stage, if any of the blastomeres are separated, each blastomere has the potential to give rise to the whole embryo and this phenomena is termed as totipotency. So, for example, the eggs of chordates and echinoderms. So, this is basically the classification of eggs based upon the different criteria which we have undertaken. Uh, with this note, sir, thank you ma'am, thank you so very much for giving us a very, very precious session. Dear friends, for your feedback, sir, uh, you can definitely contact us uh, through our email id info.cc at the rate and ic.in. We will be meeting again very soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you ma'am. Thank, thank you so very much.